Mark Shields here, Rapa Nui Life, where I share with you all the insights uh, about Rapa Nui Easter Island, what it's like living here, about the history, the politics, you name it, we're going to get into it. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, please make sure that you hit that subscribe button. If you enjoy this uh, video, please make sure to hit the like button. And if you find it super interesting, share it. Today, I want to talk to you about the stars and how they relate to Polynesia and Rapa Nui. We're going to talk about the Polynesians, where they came from, where they colonized, how they were able to travel such vast distances, colonizing a larger area than any other people group in the world, how they use the stars to do that. We're going to dive into some archaeoastronomy, how once arriving here, the Rapa Nui used the stars to navigate their day-to-day -day lives, and we're going to finish off with some general astronomy. Before I get into it, I'd like to give a shout out to Polynesian Voyaging Society, uh, headed by Charles Nanai Thompson. A lot of the information that I'll be using today came from them. Thank you to Aota Puna, who helped us with our star compass here on the island. I'd really like to thank Amos Dowell as well, who did the lion's share of, of this presentation that I'm going to give to you. Without further ado, let's get into it. When carving up the South Pacific Ocean, ethnographers put into three different categories. So they called one area Micronesia. Uh, they were kind of fairer skinned people, or smaller, a little bit sort of Filipino looking. They inhabited little tiny islands more towards the north and west. Below that was Melanesia because of the dark skinned people that they found living in those areas. And then Polynesia, the largest of those three areas, colonized by one people group, the Polynesians, sharing a similar language, similar culture and similar way of life. There are hundreds and hundreds of languages through Melanesia and many different languages through Micronesia, but one common language in Polynesia. So where did these people come from? The Polynesian people group came by way of Taiwan Indonesia and Melanesia and formed a separate group of people in the islands of Tonga and Samoa having arrived there around about 800. These people formed their own language, their own way of life and of course living on islands they were fishermen. The natural progression of that is those fishermen started branching out little by little to explore islands a little further away. Around about 700 AD, there was this great push into central Polynesia and then out to the outer limits of Hawaii and New Zealand in the southwest and here Rapa Nui in the southeast. So by 1000 AD, most of Polynesia was colonized. There are quite a number of different types of islands that they colonized. High islands such as Hawaii, American Samoa and Rapa Nui. These are tops of underwater mountain, usually found in a mountain range. And these particular islands are the ones that have pushed themselves above the sea surface. In warmer parts of Polynesia, high islands actually formed coral reefs. And these are known as composite islands. Sometimes uh, the ocean and the wind would uh, wear away and destroy the mountainous part in the middle, just leaving the fringing reef. And these are known as atolls. Many of these are only two or three meters above sea level. So the rising oceans in the world are a real worry for the people living in these particular places. Another type of island is the raised coral atoll. Basically on a mountain range, a uh, mountain has uh, not quite breached the water surface, but it's shallow enough that it's formed a coral reef. And then the shifting of the tectonic plates has actually pushed that up above the water surface. Super difficult islands to uh, get a boat to because they're surrounded by jutting cliffs. And last but not least, continental island. And there's only one of these in Polynesia. That's uh, New Zealand, by far the biggest island. And it was formed by the moving on of tectonic plates, pushing the mountainous area of New Zealand up from the ocean floor. Now they colonized all this area using boats. These boats, we don't have them anymore. Unfortunately, they were made out of wood. And so over time they have disintegrated, but we do have artists impressions of them. And unlike the European style boat, uh, these are double hulled. Uh, rather than single hulled. So how on earth did they navigate such a vast area? What were the methods they used? First thing, as they were heading off from land, they would take into account certain markers on the island that they were leaving from. So for example, if they saw a bunch of trees, they might align that with the highest point of the island and take that line as they headed out. Now they would often head out a few hours before dark so that once they lost sight of those particular bearings, they could then take into account the stars. The sun and the moon rise in the east and in the west so they could use the sun and the moon as a general bearing if they wanted to become more specific and they could use the stars the stars uh, behavior being very consistent 
It's like having a big compass in the sky. And super important when you're dealing with the stars is knowing where the northern celestial pole is and the southern celestial pole. These points are if you draw an imaginary line through the Earth as it rotates on its axis, it's those points in the sky above the North Pole and directly above the South Pole. And these were super important to know how far north or how far south you'd gone. If you're on uh, the North Pole looking straight up, the North Star will be directly above you. If you're on the equator looking at that North Star, it will be at 180 degrees. As you go further north, that star begins to rise and you get to be able to see how many degrees north you are by looking at that point. Let's pretend we're heading off to Hawaii from Easter Island, Rapa Nui. Instead of trying to take a direct line to Hawaii, where the target would be much smaller, we would uh, go in a general direction towards the north perhaps keeping the rising sun on our right and the setting sun on our left. Once we hit the equator, we would uh, get a bearing on that northern star. As we continued to go north, that star would rise. As it got to 20 degrees above the horizon, the navigators would simply turn left. The Hawaiian chain of islands is quite long from north to south, it's unlikely that you would miss it. And what would they use to measure that angle? Well, generally they would use their own hands, putting them out in front of them, certain points on their hand, would be certain degrees that they had gone. So they would also take into account the swells. Swell patterns are always fairly consistent. Let's say they were heading northeast and they had used some landmarks on their island to head out in that direction. Well, once they got a fair way out to sea, could no longer see those landmarks, they would then take note of what direction the swell was hitting the front of the boat and they would keep that angle for as long as they possibly could uh, using the stars also uh, to get their bearings. They would know the temperatures of the different places that they needed to go. So the Humboldt Current, although it's further north from Easter Island, is actually much colder. And so as they started testing the temperature of the different areas they were passing through, they could figure out where they were and how far north they were also. A change in the swell pattern might show that there was actually an island in the vicinity. If you can imagine you're at the high seas, you're just getting this constant swell up and down, up and down. Well, it might start changing, rocking slightly. It probably means that an island that you can't see is, is breaking that swell pattern. The master navigators would know which direction was changing that uh, swell pattern and that they could head there if they were looking for islands in the vicinity. During the summer in Rapa Nui, Easter Island, the prevailing wind is actually from the east uh, going west. So it makes sense that if you wanted to go west, you would probably do that during the summer months. And these master navigators would also not sleep very much because they just, they needed to use their basic intuition. They would get a sense of where they were, only sleeping for 20 minutes at a time so as not to lose the sense of distance. It was easy enough to find how far north or how far south they had gone, but going from east to west there is no static points that you can get reference from. Cloud formations would really help as well because clouds form differently over land and although they might not see the land itself, uh, they might see the cloud and having seen the cloud they would then head towards it and eventually the land would come into view. Not so much with the atolls, atolls are very low-lying islands, but what the atolls do is they reflect a different colour into the clouds above the atoll. By checking out the different colours of the clouds, they would know if there was an atoll in the close vicinity of where they were. As they got closer to land, they would generally see more things floating in the ocean. Debris and rivers wash out into the ocean. So that as you get closer to the land, uh, you see floating coconuts and trees, and the water often gets a little dirtier, especially when you're coming to the mouth of rivers. If they saw birds, that could be a super good sign as well, because, well, birds showed that you were probably close to land depending what bird it was. So if you saw a white tern you were within 190 kilometers or a black noddy you'd be within 65 kilometers of land. You'd want to be careful which birds you followed though because uh, the albatross, uh, the red-tailed tropic bird and the frigate bird can spend very long periods of time at sea. So let's dig a little bit deeper into navigating by the stars. So once we understand the behavior of the stars we can start figuring out exactly which distances we've gone north to south, which way we are going depending which stars we're following. The stars always rise and fall at exactly the same spot when seen from the same latitude. They always move through the sky in the same trajectory. Uh, this uh, Rapa Nui compass actually shows how the Polynesians uh, would divide uh, the skies up into different categories. Uh, they would actually make 
star houses. Let's imagine we wanted to head towards the northeast. We would look at the star compass and we would see which stars were actually rising from that particular house on the compass and as they rose we would continually continually follow those particular stars and check out this uh, quick video which shows what it would be like as we're looking we are a navigator on the equator heading east So they rise and set at the same points, they take the same trajectory through the sky, but one difference every single night is because we are uh, slowly moving our way around the sun uh, 365 days a year, that means every single day we are at a slightly different angle to the stars. Now just remember, the stars aren't moving at all, it's us that are moving. We are rotating and we are moving around the sun. So each night the stars seem to rise four minutes earlier. That means a star that I see tonight at nine o'clock in the evening rising on the east will in a two months time be well up in the sky by nine o'clock at the same time. Uh, number four, because the stars rise slightly later every day, this means that certain stars aren't visible in the night sky. Why? because they're out during the day and the sun's in our way so we can't see them. This graph shows us that as we are orbiting around the sun, in March for example, we get a good look at Leo in the night sky. As we're on that side of the sun during that time of year, we can't see Aquarius because the sun is in our way. We would have to wait uh, for a few more months before Aquarius comes into view and six months later Aquarius would be the main constellation in the night sky at the same time. The Northern Celestial Pole and the Southern Celestial Pole can both be seen in their respective hemispheres, but they can't be seen from the opposite hemisphere. So if I'm in the South, I cannot see the North and vice versa. If you want to find the Northern Celestial Pole, super easy, we mentioned that earlier, it's just to find the North Star. Most people in the Northern Hemisphere, they generally know Polaris, which is uh, very bright in the night sky and doesn't move. But in the Southern Hemisphere, it's a little more difficult. Uh, there is no star in the point of the Southern Celestial Pole. We generally have to use uh, little tricks with other stars to figure out where the Southern Celestial Pole is, but once uh, you understand where the stars are, it's super easy to do. The stars that go from east to west feel like they're moving a lot faster, um, and the ones that are in the south or in the north feel that like they go slower. This is just a, a trick of the eyes. They're not moving at all, we're just moving in relation to them. The cross is super easy to find in the southern hemisphere, it's a very clear looking uh, cross in the sky, however we don't want to get it mixed up with the false cross which is slightly bigger and not quite as accentuated. How do we know the difference? The southern cross always has two pointers right beside it pointing at it. So as long as we can get a, a look onto the Southern Cross, what we do is we take that cross, we take the length of it on the same line of it, and then we multiply it four and a half times. Once we do that, we will find the Southern Celestial Pole. The Southern Cross is constantly moving around that point, and it doesn't matter where it is in the night sky, it's always pointing towards the Southern Celestial Pole. And sometimes during the year you can't see the Southern Cross, and so what we would do in those particular times, are there are some bright stars, Canopus and Arcana and we would draw an equilateral triangle and the third point of that equilateral triangle is the Southern Celestial Pole. Now how did they actually find this island you might still be asking? Because I've pretty much explained the nuances of navigation and perhaps once you've already found a place to get back there, but how did they find it in the first place? Well recent evidence has found uh, Polynesian skulls and Polynesian chicken bones in the south of Chile. It's almost certain that this amazing navigational race found their way from Polynesia over to South America and were perhaps even doing quite a few trips back and forth. So on one of those trips they stumbled across uh, Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and then went back to their homeland which was perhaps in the Marquesas Islands or somewhere in French Polynesia, and then using the stars and all those things that I've explained, they came back. And they came back prepared to colonize, we know that, because they brought with them chickens, rats, sweet potato, yams. They also brought with them a viable population and so it seems that they didn't just stumble across here, that they stumbled across it, they went back to where they were from and they came back prepared to colonize. 
So once they colonized here in Rapa Nui, the stars didn't cease to be important. Although trans-Pacific trips probably stopped a couple of hundred years later, the people on Rapa Nui continued to use the stars to read the seasons, to know when to plant. Uh, they also aligned their statues uh, for telling stories, to tell their history. Almost all the stars in the night sky have names, have meanings, and often these meanings relate to day-to-day -day life on the island itself. They didn't have milk on the island, so they didn't call it the Milky Way galaxy. They referred to it as the great marine creature. Having arrived to the island, they built these places called Tupa. Now, they were kind of small towers, and it's believed to be the great priest would stand up the top, and they would read the stars. At other times, they would actually make their way into these areas with an open roof on the top, and as certain stars made their trajectory exactly above uh, the hole in the roof, then they would know what time of year it was. If it was an auspicious time of year, perhaps for planting or making babies. They have uh, rocks called the stargazing rocks, stargazing caves. And these were perhaps places where people went to hear stories. They didn't have uh, movie theaters on a Friday night. And so they still wanted entertainment and they were great storytellers in the Polynesian culture. And these storytellers would stand up and they would tell of the greatness of the uh, ancestors and how they lived. All the people would be enthralled by these stories as they told them beneath the blanket of stars up at certain parts of the island. All over the island there is uh, petroglyphs also etched into the rock. Many of these pertaining to different constellations. Matariki uh, being the constellation that marks the Polynesian New Year. And the Southern Cross, one of the most easily visible uh, constellations in the night sky. The Rapa Nui used a lunar calendar and we can see this etched into some of the rocks around the island. Uh, they often aligned the statues in line with the uh, rising of the sun during the winter solstice or the summer solstice or during the equinoxes. For example, uh, Akivi is thought to be aligned with the equinoxes. Hongariki is apparently aligned with the sunrise during the longest day. We've got Huriuranga which is definitely aligned with the shortest day of the year. And there's actually a moai on the island named after Mars. Uh, the name is Moai o Matamea. Matamea means the red eye. Let's dive a little bit into the vastness of the universe. So let's put in perspective how big the universe is compared to us. So we are just a little planet of a number of planets orbiting a small star uh, in our Milky Way galaxy. Now, our Milky Way galaxy has 200 billion stars. Uh, if I was to count from one to a billion, and that's all I did through my whole life, it would take me about 30 years. If I was to count to two billion, it would take uh, roughly 60 years or almost a lifetime. So if I wanted to count the 200 billion stars and all I did was count, it would take me a hundred lifetimes. We live in a universe which has possibly up to two trillion galaxies. So this shows us our size compared to some of the other planets. You can see Mars is about half the size. The planet most similar to Earth is Venus. And here we have Earth compared to some of the larger planets. You can see uh, there is a dot, the famous dot on the front of Jupiter, and we are about the same size as that dot. That dot actually is a big storm. And here we have Jupiter compared to the Sun and compared to one of the smallest stars in the universe, which is actually one of the brightest. It's called Sirius. Uh, Sirius compared to Aldebaran and then Aldebaran compared to Betelgeuse. So real sense of the vastness of the universe, of the stars, of the planets. And I encourage you, if you ever make it to uh, Easter Island, Rapa Nui, that you come look us up and do a stargazing tour with us. There's my plug. And uh, check out the stars on one of the best and cleanest skies in the world. Uh, we don't have much light pollution so it's 